the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. I know that many of you give when you're at church. Uh, please continue to give to the church even while you might be unable to attend. Being a small church, that's a very small amount, but it's necessary to afford rent, uh, utilities, to be able to broadcast as we do. You can give online at calvarybirmingham.com. When you're there, just click on give. You all know that we've never passed a plate. Uh, I don't talk about giving to the church except you know, when it comes up uh, in the text of the Bible. Most other churches put a, a lot of effort into making money so they can support a large staff. Uh, their pastors write books, they hold conferences, they make movies, they push their congregations to give more and more with promises of God showing favor to those who give. We have only talked about money when it comes into the text of the Bible, when it works with the text that we are in. I don't push books, I, I don't come up with conferences, and I don't make promises of God multiplying gifts back to the giver. People who are guilted into it or who are made to think that their giving somehow commends them to God, that is people who are manipulated, do tend to give more. But we don't do that. So we don't have a large amount of savings that we can draw from and in these extraordinary times I find myself in the position of desperately needing to ask. I don't ask you to give sacrificially unless the Lord moves you to do that. I just ask that you consider giving so that we can continue. Without being here uh, at the church there are several ways you can give. Uh, you can give by mail, either set up automatic contributions through your bank or, or a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Birmingham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online. Go to calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, click on Giving, and it will take you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please, my friend, please pray about giving into this ministry so that we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. I sincerely hope everyone had a fantastic Christmas. It is good to see you here this morning. Our Wednesday broadcast service was from Luke 2 in the birth of Christ, and today we're going to deviate from our current verse-by-verse -verse study in Matthew to look at the subject of Christology, uh, that is the study of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we're digging deep this morning, doctrinally deep, but first let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new morning, the breath that you have placed in our lungs, the beating of our hearts. Lord, you are truly the living God. You're compassionate, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We ask as we enter into this study that you would give us wisdom and understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask anyone who is Jesus Christ. And the answer you will often get is more along the lines of who Jesus Christ is to them. Um, but what does the Bible say 
about who Jesus is. What the Bible tells us about Jesus does not always match up with who people will say Jesus is. The fact is that what some churches teach about Jesus doesn't actually line up with the sound doctrine of the apostles. And then there is also the fact that many believers would be hard-pressed to confidently explain to anyone who Jesus is. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to be saved, nor do you have to have a firm grasp on biblical doctrine. So if the best someone can do is say, Jesus is my Savior, well, that's really, really important. But from a doctrinal standpoint, that's just not all. And if we are going to grow in our understanding of the Bible and of Jesus, studying doctrine is a fantastically great help. As I'm sure you guys know, the uniqueness of Christianity is the person, Jesus Christ. The distinctiveness of Christ is the fact that he is the God-man. In other words, he is the divine human being, and that is something completely and absolutely unique. Now, the fact that I just said divine human being, some people would take issue with, but how are you going to put this? Most people will say 100% God, 100% man. It's the exact same thing as what I just said. But it's also one of those hard things to express in a way that everyone will agree with. Someone somewhere will take issue with however which way it is expressed. Two people will say the same thing, but disagree because of the language that is used. But there are also those who want to change things. They want to add in things or take away things for their own comfort or their own advancement. This underscores the importance of sound Bible-based doctrine. The Word of God is canon. It, It means that The Bible is the ruler. It is the measure, the governor, the principle, that which has the final say. And we use it so that we are on the same page, so to speak. And whereas many people have had many things to say about who Jesus is and the offices that Jesus holds, none of it is truly sound doctrine unless the Bible says so. That Jesus was 100% God and 100% man is also a concept very difficult to grasp, difficult to understand. For we have no basis for comparison with anyone else, his equivalent. There has never been anyone like him. And so to question the fact or even misspeak about it can cause accusation to come our way by those who deem themselves more spiritual. But Is it something that cannot be researched? Is it something that cannot be looked into? Is it something that can't even be questioned? Of course not. This is not a a mystery imposed on us that we are to receive without question. After all, investigation and scholarly research requires questions. Questions lead us to conclusions and then to deeper understanding. So, like all right biblical doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus that we are going to study today is a conclusion which grows out of the evidence in the Bible. Many facts point to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is indeed God, and still many others lead to the conclusion that he is truly human. At the same time, we see only one person moving across the pages of the Gospels. The union of undiminished deity and perfect humanity forever in one person, that is Jesus, is called the doctrine of the hypostatic union. The term hypostatic union speaks of the union of two hypostases or or natures, and this is the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of hypostatic union is the term used to describe how God the Son Jesus Christ took on a human nature, yet remained fully God at the same time. To dig into this, we need to consider both the deity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus. And let's start by looking then at the deity of Jesus. And further, let's start at the beginning. Well, as much as we can, let's start with his preexistence. We have just celebrated the birth of Christ just a a few days ago. And and a big part of that is the nativity story, which takes place in Bethlehem with the birth of Christ. 
Did Christ exist before he was born at Bethlehem? The answer is yes. And the Bible contains evidence of this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Micah 2 teaches the eternity of the Son when it says he is of old from everlasting. The word translated from of old and speaking of the Son in Micah 5 2 is Kadim. It's the same word used in Habakkuk 1 12, which speaks of God the Father's eternal nature using the phrase from everlasting. So then, the Father is from everlasting, and so is the Son, reaffirming that what God is, the Son is. Isaiah, prophesying of the coming Messiah, the Son, he wrote in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In addition to that, Jesus himself claimed to be preexistent. The Gospel of John in chapter 8 records Jesus saying, Before Abraham was, I am. The key to that text is the statement, I am. For the first part, by the statement, Jesus claims to have existed before Abraham. But the greater point of the statement is its identification with the sacred name of God, Yahweh, and the statement God made when he identified himself to Moses, I am who I am. But that's not all. There is more evidence of his pre-existence as, as, as presented to us in Scripture. There is certain work said to be done by Christ, which could have only been accomplished if he were pre-existent. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. For Jesus to be God made flesh, it would be necessary for him to be pre-existent. That is, existing before he was born. But even more, existing before anything was. Now we'll talk more about his claims to be God and his pre-existence as we go along this morning. So let's start with now his deity. Many in our day deny the deity of Christ. There are even those in the pulpit who deny it, though they are usually very subtle about it, sneaking it in by teaching as doctrine that which is actually man-made. And by denying the deity of Christ, they undermine the central aspect of Christianity, removing from it the divine Savior. Christ and Christians have their enemies who do, in fact, seek to undermine the faith. And history is littered with those who sought to do so. Very vividly in the text of the Gospels, Acts, as well as the Epistles, we see those who opposed the Gospel and denied the deity of Christ. There were also the Ebionites from the, the Hebrew uh, Ebionim, meaning poor ones, a Jewish sect that appeared in the first century AD. They came out of those that opposed the gospel during the time of the apostles and whom Paul referred to as the Judaizers. They believed in one God and taught that Jesus was Messiah, but rejected his deity. Early on, they used the gospel of Matthew with the birth narrative edited out, but later they set aside Matthew's gospel and they created their own gospel. And then there was the same, at the same time, or around the same time, the dynamic monarchians. Now, monarchianism referred to single, referred to a single rule in the form of denying God's triune nature and thus denying the person of Christ. What they held to was what is now referred to as patri, pa, uh, passionism. Patripassionism, um, the, the heretical belief that, that God died on the cross in the form of Jesus and, Jesus, and and thus Jesus did not possess full deity. This is a belief that is today taught in popular books and movies such as The Shack. During the time of the Reformation, the Socinians followed their example and regarded Jesus as merely a man. 
They claim that the theological matters about the nature of God cannot go beyond the finite understanding of the human mind. Thus, the the triune nature of God cannot be, including, of course, that Jesus is 100% 100 man and 100% God. Today, this idea continues with Unitarian and other belief systems that oppose biblical belief. So the denial of who the Bible teaches us that Jesus is has been going on for quite a long time. And it continues today with those who not only deny who Jesus is, but by those who, in a very sneaky way, undermine it. In fact, it's to the point where even those who claim belief might regard Jesus as either just a great man, a good man, or a very dedicated and committed man, or a good teacher, but they do not in any way recognize his deity. And often along with such views of Christ goes a denial of the biblical accounts of his miraculous birth, his death, and his resurrection. Such denials often look for naturalistic or New Age mystical explanations for the miracles that he performed. Now popularly, opponents of his deity assert that Jesus of Nazareth never claimed to be God. They say that it was his followers who made that claim for him, and of course they were mistaken. Now this idea is absolutely false, for he himself claimed to be God, as we have already recognized and will continue to demonstrate. Now obviously, opponents of Christ's deity do not consider the Bible as authoritative. Denial of the infallibility of the Bible does not always end up, though, with denying the deity of Christ. However, denial of the deity of Christ is always accompanied by the accuracy of Scripture. There is simply too much evidence in Scripture for his deity to do otherwise. Now, we touched on it a moment ago, but let's consider the scriptural evidence more deeply. Scriptural evidence includes Jesus' assertions of deity, Jesus' works, the characteristics of Jesus, and the ascriptions of Jesus. So let's work through this list of evidences, starting with Jesus' assertions of deity. Jesus, who was born to the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, miraculously by the working of the Holy Spirit, and who was taken to Egypt to escape Herod's murderous plot, and later grew up in Nazareth, the eldest of brothers and sisters, who looked like any Jewish man of that time, and experienced everything they did, and that you and I do, including the loss of his heavenly or uh, loss of his earthly father. And as the eldest, the need to then take care of his family. Jesus claimed equality with God when he said that he and the Father were one, incurring the wrath of the religious leaders as recorded in John 5 and 10. Those who heard him make this statement understood exactly what he was saying, as evidenced by their accusing him of blasphemy. If Jesus had claimed to be just a good person or simply a great person or even just a good teacher or some extra special super person, they would not then have gone on to, to accuse him of blasphemy. In Matthew 26, when Jesus stood before the high priest under oath, he very clearly answered positively to the question of whether he was the Christ. In both John 10.36 and Matthew 26.63, the phrase son of God is used. And some claim that its, that its use means something less than deity. That is not true, however. They only make that claim in order to avoid the conclusion that Christ claimed to be God. But it is an ignorant argument to make. In Jewish usage, the term son of did not generally imply any subordination, but rather equality and identity of nature. For instance, Bar Kokhba, who led the Jewish revolt of 132 AD in the reign of Hadrian, was called by a name which means son of the star. And he took this name to identify himself as the star predicted in Balaam's pronouncement from Numbers 24, 17, a star shall come out of Jacob. Another, for instance, is found in Acts 4, 36. The name son of encouragement means the encourager. 
Of course, there's also the sons of thunder by which Jesus referred to James and John, meaning by that name, thunderous men. Son of man especially is applied to Christ in Daniel 7.13 and then many more times in the New Testament. Essentially means the representative man. So then for Christ to say, I am the son of God, was understood by the people as Jesus identifying himself as God, absolutely equal with the Father. And speaking of scriptural evidence, not only did Jesus make the claim to be equal with God for himself, but the writers of the New Testament did the same. You can find those in John 1.1, 1, 1, in John 20.28, 20, in Romans 9.5, Philippians 2.6, and of course Titus chapter 2, verse 13. The deity of Jesus is also evident in his works. Jesus claimed to do certain things which only God could do. Consider Mark 2, 1 through 12. In a classic confrontation with the scribes, the, the Lord demonstrated he had the power to forgive sins by healing a paralyzed man. Religious leaders who were present for this, scribes, considered this claim to be blasphemy. But why? Because they recognized that only God can forgive sins. So then to confirm the truth of his claim, Jesus pointed to the miracle that they could see, that is, the healing of the paralytic man. In other words, the miracle of healing was done in order to validate Christ's claim to be able to forgive sins. On other occasions, which I'll give you references for, but we, we just don't have time to dig into them today. You may want to jot these references down and perhaps look at them later. But on other occasions, Jesus claimed that all judgment was given into his hands, such as in his, his discourse of John 5, specifically verse 27, that he would send the Holy Spirit, see that in John 15, 26, that he would be the one to raise the dead in John 5, 25, these are all entitlements of deity. Only God has the power to do them, and only God has the liberty to do them. So then his statements either substantiate his claim to be God, or else they make him a liar. But as is the case of the healing of the paralytic man, it's not just words. There are works attributed to Christ, which only God can perform further substantiating his equality with God. In Colossians 1.16, we have his work of creating, also in John 1.3 and Hebrews 1, as well as upholding all things. And then in Acts 17, verse 31, he is said to be the judge of all men. Next, we have as evidence of Jesus' deity, his characteristics. Jesus possesses characteristics which only God has. In Scripture, he claimed to be all-powerful, such as in Matthew 28, 18 and Revelation 1, verse 8. Additionally, he demonstrated knowledge that could only have come from his being omniscient, such as in Mark 2, 8 and John 1, 48. Now, omniscience is one of the qualities of God and is defined as the state of having total knowledge, the state of knowing everything. Consider also that Jesus made promises, which we often quote, that depends on his being present everywhere, such as in Matthew 18 and 28, being present with believers. These extremely distinctive and, and distinguishing claims indicate that he was either God or a very capable deceiver. And then we have as evidence of Jesus' deity, his ascriptions. Others ascribed to him, the prerogatives of deity and substantiation of his own claims. The Bible in places like Matthew 14, Philippians 2, and Hebrews 1 records how he was worshipped by men and by angels. Scripture also couples his name with other members of the Trinity in a relationship of equality, such as in the Great Commission of Matthew 28 and in benedictions like we find in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where it says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We find in Hebrews 1 how the author declared that Jesus was the same in substance with the Father, saying that Jesus is the express image of his person. So together with Paul's statement from Colossians that in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, 
These are very strong declarations of his full deity, equal with the deity of the Father and the Spirit. Two, he is called by a reference reserved only by God that is highest in the New Testament. This is, this is the equivalent of calling him Yahweh. In Luke 176, it says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. This could only be true if he were fully God. Consider also other names of deity which he has given. In Hebrews 1 8, God. In Matthew 22, 43 through 45, Lord. In Revelation 19 16, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. With all of this evidence, we can only conclude that Christ's deity is fully attested by the ascriptions given him in the New Testament. Now, please note that in regards to these evidences of the deity of Christ, there are two sources. There are the claims which the Lord himself made with his own words, and then there were the claims of others about Jesus. And both are equally valid. And many people willingly receive the fact of Jesus being 100% God. However, they find difficulty in Jesus being 100% man at the same time. So now let's look at the humanity of Christ. Jesus was not only fully God, but also fully man, with one important difference from ourselves. And that difference is that he was without sin. No other human being has that characteristic. Let's deal first with the Incarnation. The Incarnation was the way in which Christ took on humanity. The word means in flesh. And the method of the Incarnation was the virgin birth. Now some people find fault in the interpretation of the Hebrew word Alma in Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The Hebrew word Alma uh, means marriageable girl and young woman, depending on the context. So you can see that it's, it's not necessarily specific, nor does the context of Isaiah 7 lend to the word uh, a specific meaning. However, the New Testament clears this up, leaving no question that the prophecy of Isaiah intends for us to understand it as virgin. Additionally, the language and conjugation used in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16 informs us that the birth of Jesus was connected exclusively with Mary and not Joseph. The scriptures say only that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary to generate the child within her. But why this? Why this way of incarnation? Or even why the incarnation? Well, the New Testament gives us all the reasons. In John 1.18, to reveal God to men. In 1 Peter 2.21, to provide an example for living. In Hebrews 10, 1-10, to provide a sacrifice for sin. In 1 John 3.8, to destroy the works of the devil. In Hebrews 5, 1-2, to enable him to be a merciful and faithful high priest. And in Luke 1, 31-33, to fulfill the promise of a son to sit on the throne of David forever. Only a man can die. So the Savior had to come, had to become incarnate in order to be able to die. Because he lived here on earth as a man, he can understand and sympathize as our high priest. The Bible gives us proofs of Jesus' humanity. It seems quite obvious, but because there are various false teachings that claim Jesus was just a, an apparition or a phantom or a spirit, uh, such as in docetism. Docetism is a, a Gnostic heresy stating that Jesus was on earth as this phantom-like being. However, Jesus interacted physically with people, touching, being touched, eating, and doing other things that requires a physical, real body. Jesus was born as a baby, and he developed in the way that humans do. He referred to himself as a man and was recognized by others as a man. Consider the text of John 8.40, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Now, obviously, 
if he were not a real physical man, the interactions recorded in Scripture could not have happened. And certainly, people would not have recognized him as a physical person. Additionally, we find evidence in the fact that Jesus was hungry, he was thirsty, he grew tired, he experienced love and compassion, and he wept. The humanity of Christ included body, soul, and spirit, material and immaterial. In other words, not partial humanity, but complete humanity. It was not that the humanity provided only the body while the deity provided the soul and the spirit in the person of Christ. The humanity was complete and therefore included both the material and immaterial aspects of humanity that we all have. Jesus himself said things like, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Finally, while identifying himself as equal with God, Jesus also identified himself in human terms, such as Son of Man, Son of David, Jesus, and as simply a man. So what is this unique union of 100% God and 100% man? This union of deity and humanity in Christ. How deity and humanity were united in the person of Jesus Christ has been debated hotly throughout church history. Some have denied the deity of Christ. Others denied the reality of his humanity. Some fall somewhere in the middle saying his humanity was, was incomplete. Still others like Todd White or some NAR churches and pastors say that he was adopted as divine at his baptism. Jehovah's Witnesses claim he was God's highest created representative. And some others hold that he was fully human, including a sinful nature. And God worked through sinful Jesus to reveal himself. But Orthodox belief, handed down from the doctrine of the apostles, has always held that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. Now, perhaps you've heard something about a, a doctrine of kenosis. The, it, it's an important topic and a great debate when looking at the incarnation of Christ. The best text for this is a text that gives the doctrine its name, kenosis. That text is Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Let's read a few of those verses from the New English Translation uh, version, which is very literal in its translation of the Greek. There it reads, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who, through, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now the great debate is around the connotation of the verb from verse 7, uh, kino, empty. Uh, it means empty or, or render void. Now the question is, did Christ empty himself of some or all aspects of deity when he came to earth? That he possessed the attributes of deity before the incarnation or even uh, in the incarnation, as stated in verse 6. But then, in what sense does Paul mean that Christ emptied himself at the incarnation? Well, based on the evidence of Scripture we've already looked at, he did things that only God could do. It could not have been a subtraction of deity. Rather, it is the addition of humanity. He humbled himself by taking on humanity with its limitations, but this did not involve the giving up of any divine attributes. And this is why the New King James Version translates the verse based on intent, saying with verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Any doctrine of kenosis which says Christ surrendered attributes at the incarnation is in direct conflict with scriptural evidence concerning his person during the incarnation. His humanity was not a glorified humanity and was thus subject to temptation, to weakness, to pain, and to sorrow. Jesus never ceased to be God during any part of his earthly ministry. He did, not, or he did set aside his heavenly glory. He also volunteer, voluntarily refrained from using his divinity to make his way easier. 
During his earthly ministry, Christ completely submitted himself to the will of the Father. Jesus himself said that he did and spoke as the Father told him to do. Choosing not to use his divine attributes is quite different from saying that he gave them up. Jesus had to be 100% God and 100% man and sinless in order to be the perfect substitutionary sacrifice for us. Now let's grasp this more firmly by looking into the earthly life of Christ just a bit. The earthly life of Christ is doctrinally important for several reasons. First, it proved the validity of his claims and thus his worthiness to be the Savior. It was the time when the Lamb was tested and proved to be a proper sacrifice for sin. Second, his earthly life gave an example for his people to follow. For instance, his self-sacrificing love. Third, it was during his earthly life that his teachings were given. Some of those teachings concerned the Jewish people directly, and some were given in anticipation of the founding of his church. Now, the life of Christ can be divided into three parts. First, there were the years of preparation, beginning with his birth in Bethlehem, through the years of infancy, childhood, and growth into full manhood, and concluding with his baptism and temptation. Second, there there followed the years of public ministry, which included his early ministry. And that ministry was in Judea, Galilee, and Perea. Uh, That is, Perea is the, the area on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. And third, there were events leading up to his death and the crucifixion itself. So a a thorough study of Christology would be impossible really to fit into a 45 to to one hour message. It, It would dig into the events of the life of Christ in conjunction with the offices he held, prophet, priest, and king. And we've talked already about the incarnation and dealt with Christological issues surrounding that. And being that we just celebrated Christmas, that I feel was appropriate. As we study through the Gospel of Matthew, we'll obviously be dealing with the earthly ministry of Christ, and we'll deal with Christological issues as we do so. A thorough Christology would also examine the resurrection and the ascension of Christ and his continuing ministry on our behalf. But again, we'd have to spend another hour or perhaps more to even touch on that. So I think we'll save that for Easter. So let's wrap back then to the birth of Christ and make some perhaps less scholarly but still meaningful observations. The circumstances of Jesus' birth were simple. In Joseph's hometown, on the bottom floor of a house with friends and family, a donkey, sheep, and probably a cow. But out in the fields of Bethlehem, where the Passover lambs were being raised, the announcement that they received was a little less reserved. A herald of God, an angel, stood before the shepherds and announced the birth of the Messiah. This was followed by an army of angels praising God and proclaiming God's blessing of peace and goodwill on humanity. What a glorious and a wonderful announcement of a very simple gospel. The gospel is just that. It's simple. Educating ourselves in the sound doctrine is important in preserving the certain word that's been handed down to us through the apostles and and in preserving the gospel message as it's been given to us by God. But if we are not careful, we can get so involved in this that we forget that the gospel itself is not complicated. And out of pride, we can argue over things that even the apostles would not have argued God could have made it complicated. He could have created a bunch of steps and levels that you have to attain before you could even be considered eligible for salvation. He could have based salvation on the discovery of secret knowledge so only a few worthy people could reach it. But instead, God made it very simple and readily available. And that's what makes this announcement of the birth of Jesus so glorious. The events of Jesus' birth are more marvelous than words can express. He was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem, exactly as prophesied many years before. Jesus was conceived in Mary, not by man, but by the Holy Spirit of God. As the Apostle John wrote, Jesus existed before the creation of the world. Hebrews 1 tells us that it was through Jesus that God made the world. He is part of the Holy Trinity we know as, as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
The Son of God came in human form for a purpose. He came to die as a willing sacrifice in payment for the sins of mankind. And he did this to provide eternal salvation as a free gift to all who will accept it and follow him. Christmas is not about the Savior's infancy. It is all about his deity. The reality that God was born into the world. Without forsaking his divine nature or diminishing his deity, he was born into our world as a tiny baby. He was fully human with all the needs and emotions that are common to each and every one of us. Yet he was also fully God, all wise and all powerful. Colossians 1 puts it best this way, and we'll close with this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. What a grand and wonderful thing to celebrate. And I hope that everyone had a great Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, light of the world. As we celebrate your birth this Christmas, may we see the world in the light of your great sacrifice. As you chose the lowly and the poor to receive the greatest news the world has ever known, so may we worship you in meekness of heart. As you ministered among the weak, the hungry, even those who hated you with patience and caring, may we also be gracious Thank you for the gift of your love. May we be a shining example of that love to others. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, that your story has become our story. And we celebrate your birth. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as he has so abundantly poured out his love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. 
Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to CalvaryBirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to CalvaryBirmingham.com and select Contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting Donate. You have been listening to Grace, Hope, Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.